All right, everybody, we're back with another episode of the Steelers Chat. As you can tell, I might have been yelling a little bit on Monday night, but it's okay. It's all right. We have Alex Kazora here today from the Steelers Depot. How you doing, Alex? Hey, D, hanging in there. It got a win. It's a heck of a way to do it, but that's the Steelers' nature, <laughs> isn't it? Yes, uh, one and one against the uh, Cleveland Browns last week. Um, I'm not going to start where the whole national media is starting. We're going to start with the Steelers' defense today. <laughs> Fair enough. I'm um, with you. Yeah. What did you see? We kind of went into week two without Cam Hayward, not necessarily knowing what they were going to look like, if they were going to be able to stop the run. They did have some difficulties. But what did you see as maybe an upside, you know, for that line and that defense? Yeah, I think individually there's talent there. And as pass rushers, I mean, Pittsburgh has more success sacking Cleveland than any other team does. It, it's, it doesn't matter what the line looks like, who the Steelers have, who they don't, who the quarterback is. I mean, over the last 17 games against the Browns, they've sacked Cleveland 82 times. I mean, that's just crazy wow. numbers like that. So, I mean, they certainly got after Watson. You saw the splash, the upside that TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith made. And so I think this game had a lot of lows for the defense, but there were enough highs. And when they hit, they hit big. They're putting the ball in the end zone. And you saw Logan Joby make an impact early. Mon Adams, as a pass rusher, uh, made an impact as well. And so I think there's a lot of things to clean up, but there's at least some splash and some juice there that's going to help mitigate that negativity. Now, one of my favorite linebackers is Roberts, um, and he had a good goal line play towards, I believe that was the end of the game, the third or fourth, it might have been fourth quarter. Um, that game was so long that I can't, it all kind of runs together. <laughs> It was after the oh. uh, the Ford 69-yard run on that first and goal. Oh, yes, it was. And Mink, that's when Minka first that left out, left out right. the game. So right. was that in the third quarter? The quarters run together was second half. I yeah. think it was third quarter. That's yeah, I think it was yeah. <laughs> But uh, like I said, the game was – Have you what have you seen from him that kind of stands out? Because he's definitely a guy I want to see more on the field. He's got a personality. I mean, his personality is he's a downhill thumper. That is his style, and he plays to it. And we saw that in training camp. I thought he had a really good camp overall. He's an energy bringer. He's a thumper. And, you know, Mike Tomlin, it was a reference more to the offense, but he made the comment to open up his two-state presser. This offense, his team needs some swagger, some confidence, and Roberts is one of those guys. Now there's limitations. He's only going to really play in base packages, and the Browns were spreading the field out, didn't give him give him a ton of snaps. But, I mean, he... He knows what he does well. He's a downhill, meet you in the hole kind of guy, and the Browns found that out on that play. So, I mean, he's a guy that can certainly bring that intensity and kind of set the tone early and thump against the run. I, I think about if the Steelers did not pick up Quan Alexander, who is currently, I believe, leading the team in tackles now, where would we be? <laughs> oh, he brings He brings some excitement to the defense to me. But the other guy that I watch on the sidelines, which you probably can't see at home, is Nick. Nick Herbig, he has so much energy. He's on the bench jumping up and down, trying to get the crowd involved. He's on the field pushing guys around. Is there anything, is there any way that you get him more involved, even though he kind of sits behind Alex and and um, those guys on the outside? Yes. Sure. Snaps are going to be limited when you're behind TJ Watt, Alex Highsmith. I would argue the best edge rush duo in football. You have Marcus Golden, who's been a quality number three, a veteran guy that they trust and has, has made some plays. His run defense, I think, has been really solid overall. So it, it, it's going to come. Somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to get ding. Any of the other three guys, you know, miss some time. That's going to create more opportunities for Herbig, who's rotating mm -hmm. in and getting him some some work himself when he's getting work on special teams but you're right i mean i haven't seen the sideline stuff so that, that that's definitely i think a good comment by you but you just see him at training camp i mean hair on fire kind of dude high energy and just a sponge being around tj and soaking up all that he can so i think it's been a been a good start yeah. for nick herbig yeah i i really he's just a ball of energy i love it um and and there's one more guy um out there that was missing that got injured uh, Minka Fitzpatrick, did you see a big difference at home of that secondary and the communication and anything once he went out in that third quarter, I believe? 
I don't know if I could pinpoint any big issue with him being out. The one upshot is you have a couple of veterans to replace him with in DeMonte Casey in his second year with the team and Keanu Neal, who, you know, got hurt this summer a little bit, but it's been around the team enough and he's a, a veteran guy. So I didn't see any big breakdowns, but obviously you miss Minka Fitzpatrick. I was getting worried early because he, I think he made four tackles on the Browns, you know, first full drive after the pick six. And I was like, dude, yeah. I, Minka's a great tackler. It's an underrated trait, but you know, 2021, he was, had way too many tackles and kind of got some flashbacks there. So glad Minka's okay, yeah. though, seems to be generally speaking. And hopefully he'll play Sunday night. Still don't know his status for sure against the Raiders, but hopefully a guy that can be out there because the Raiders will seem that we'll have uh, Devontae Adams, their top receiver, and he wants your your best secondary out there to defend them. Yeah, I t- t- agree. Um, and I did see flashes of that 2021 Minka Fitzpatrick out there. Um, even as he went and dived and saved that that, that running uh, rushing touchdown, um, even before that, I believe in the in the first quarter, I was just like, "There goes Minka," you know, being that right. that last line of uh, effort right there for us. And I definitely saw those flashes, and it, it did scare me, but it was just like, "Well, at least somebody got right. him because nobody else can get him." Yeah, um, and he's a great tackler. Can we all agree though? And I know the conversation has calmed down a bit. That was not a dirty play on Nick Chubb. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't even know how that's a thought. It's unfortunate. Nick Chubb's a great runner. I mean, I think to me, he's the best pure runner in football. I'm devastated for him. But that is not even not even close to anything resembling a dirty play by Minka Fitzpatrick. Yeah, it it's one. It is AFC North football. That is one reason. It was not a dirty play at all. Um, it, it, it's just unfortunate. It is the game of football. Things like the, like, this, I don't want to say mistakes, but injuries like these happen. I don't want to say all the time, but they happen and they're extremely unfortunate. Um, and I, and I don't know what they showed on television. However, um, and I, they did replay it one time in the stadium. I personally was like counting the guys on the field, like, because there was two guys on the field and one Steeler, one Brown. And I was like, is that Minka Fitzpatrick? Um, so, and I couldn't see, so I'm counting the guys. I'm looking at everyone's jerseys and I'm like, that's Minka Fitzpatrick. He's, he was down as well for a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but when he finally gets up and he goes to the sideline, comes back and he goes over and he speaks to, to Nick Chubb. So I don't know if anybody saw that um, on television. I don't know what they showed, but he did go over to Nick Chubb. He did say some words to him. And um, I, I, and in, in my mind, no way, no how, if that's that's dirty or intentional that you go over there and, and you comfort someone because it, it wasn't intentional. It wasn't like that at all. It was a bang, bang play. He went low trying to get to keep that man out of the end zone. And unfortunately, it just it just happened. So, yeah, I totally agree with you. It was not not intentional, dirty play. I didn't realize he went over and talked to Chubb because all the ESPN broadcast did is a, they said, we're not going to show the replay and that you knew right there. Okay. Something terrible has just happened. And they cut the commercial. I think they came back and Chubb was almost being carted off the field at that point. So I didn't realize the Minka had spoken with him. So kudos yeah. to him. Yeah. I mean, again, I understand emotionally Browns fans can be angry about that. That's their best guy and the Steelers Raven or the Steelers Browns rivalry, but in no way, shape or form is that a, a dirty or intentional play to injure Nick Chubb. Yeah, and um, I just I, I really hope that Nick Chubb does um, get it get back and get back on the field as quickly as possible. Again, it was hard for me to see what's happening because my eyes were so focused on who who our guy was. And when they showed the replay, everyone like ooh, and I was just like, what happened? You know, like I. Um, and then it wasn't until a little bit later that I actually saw what you know happened. But um, you know. We hope he's back out there. He's a great competitor and honestly was killing us. He was killing us. Yeah. He was on the run. And he we was. knew he was. We knew he was. So um, I do want to talk about um, how we were able. I, I think TJ has a great game against Deshaun Watson. I don't know what it is about it. <laughs> Every time he plays, it's just like him and TJ end up, you know, hugging on each other. Um, the 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 Browns over the last couple of years have been started to have really good offensive lines. Did you see anything with them that was just like I don't see it. I know they had a rookie out there. Yeah, I mean, they gave what all the attention in the world. I mean, he got chipped by Njoku all game and they're sliding to him. And it's just one of those things where TJ is a fighter. And, you know, he finally on, on that sack where he broke James Harrison's record, broke the tie, okay. I should say. That was a one on one matchup, one of the few times that they left Jones on an island against uh, TJ Watt. That was a third and seven or third and eight. So, one of those situations where you're trying to get your guys out uh, in, in the pass concept. So, Watt takes advantage of that moment, but 
I mean, yeah, he makes an impact even whenever it's not sex. He had a he had a swat. I mean, one of those moments where you're getting chipped and you're like, I'm not gonna be able to get to the quarterback, get my hands up and try to read the, the quarterback's eyes and shoulder and, and knock the pass down. So he's just a relentless type of dude that's a really good technician. And when he gets the opportunity to make plays, so go out there and make plays. What are some of your biggest concerns about our defense? Is it the secondary? Like what do you, what do you I think I feel like it's still the secondary for me? Oh, and and then the run defense. Yeah, I mean, secondary is a concern, but I think run defense without Cam, I mean, they're the worst run defense in football right now. And I know they face two really good rushing attacks, two good offensive right. lines. And so th- that's part of it. But, you know, to to, to go, I, I know Cam says he's going to be back sooner than people think, and I believe him, but it's not going to be until at least after the bye at the absolute earliest. And so right. you know, can you stop the run and no one can replace Cam Hayward? And who can anchor against the run? you got some athletes that can penetrate and get up field like Ogan Joby and Adams, but who can really be that old school run stuff or maybe Braden Fahoko who got, you know, signed off the practice squad today. Hopefully he can, can play a role, but Cam is one of those guys that can just take on double teams and not be moved. And you're really missing that. So I think it all starts yeah. in Pittsburgh with run defense and it's looking really shaky right now. Speaking of shaky, we can go there now. <laughs> Let's just go on over to the offense. Um, that is definitely shaky. I was surprised I didn't see more Connor involvement. Did Connor have a catch? No, I don't believe he did. I don't think Connor had a catch. I didn't see Connor. I didn't see uh, big Pat, Pat Fryermuth involvement. I was, those were two I was looking for. And though actually there was three Allen Robinson for sure. I knew he was going to be like, I, I call him like a safety net for Kenny. Um, and he did, he did get some catches in. I mean, he, What's going? What do you? What do you think is going on? I'll I will save it. I'll, I I I'd somewhat defend Matt Canada. I'm stuttering because it's hard for me to say it, but I really do kind of give him um, a little bit of grace. Um, but uh, what do you think is going on with this offense? Yeah, it's complicated. It's layered. I, I wish I could give you a great one sentence answer, D, and be like, this is the problem. But when it's this bad, it's so many things. And it's yeah. not either or players or coaches. It's both and. It's it's players yeah. and coaches. I think everyone can be better. I, I thought the run game plan against the Browns was really more frustrating than even the pass, call, uh, pass calls, pass concepts. They try to run on the perimeter so much in this game. And you're not going to do that against a really athletic Browns front seven. I mean, JOK was just running around the entire field, shutting everything down. So it starts with a lack of a run game. I mean, they're, they're, you know, a, their running attack has been essentially non-existent and that's for multiple reasons. Um, they have not getting hats on linebackers. You had Fred Warner running free in week one. You had GOK running free in week two. I don't care who the linebacker is. If they're unblocked, they're going to make plays. And when you right. talk about elite level guys like JOK and Fred Warner, they're really going to make plays. Uh, this is a bad first down offense. They were right now they're the 28th ranked first down offense in football. I think they have, two years ago they were 32nd. Last year they were 31st on first down offense. And so they're behind the sticks. They're not in rhythm. They've not had a first down in the first quarter in both games. And so they're just really playing from behind early. And then Kenny Pickett has not played well. We have to acknowledge that. I think we all do at this point. He's missed some layups. He's forced some throws, made poor decisions. I kind of see some tunnel vision in his game right now. So do I think Canada is really elevating anyone's play? No. I thought he had a pretty boring and vanilla game plan against the Niners in week one. I wasn't overly impressed by things in week two, but I think in week two it was probably more on the players than it was the actual play call. So the bottom line though with Canada is like this is the this was supposed to be the year make or break, like put up or shut up. No more excuses. Yep. You know, everything was in place and they're not yep. getting the job done. And at some point that's a reflection, big picture, right or wrong. Of coaching, yeah, um, a coaching on all levels, right? Uh, mm-hmm. This I, I I said this uh, week one. This is the put up or shut up for Matt Canada. There is like the to me the like I said the leash was off Kenny. I felt like the, the playbook would be more open. He would be more comfortable, and and it really it just does that. The the play that we've gotten does not show that at all. Um, there are no excuses. But these guys are not executing and people don't want to people see jet sweep and they're like, oh, it's a jet sweep. Like, oh, you know, but it's the execution of it. I think these, some of these plays can work. Um, you, you, they, they can happen, but they're just not properly being executed. And I think the players know that. I think the players are seeing 
their mistakes, whether, you know, of course they're not probably intentional or anything like that, but I think collectively they're saying that they're not playing up to their ability. I don't know what's going on. Um, uh, yes, it's coaching, but like, what is it? You know, I, I know the coordinator gets so much flack of it, but like, is this offensive line coaching? Like, is, are we need to work on our blocking? Like, like what are, quarterback coaching? Coaching as a whole, I feel like, is a problem with this offense. Sure. Uh, yeah, they're not absolved from it. I don't think anybody's absolved from from things right now with how how bad things have looked overall. I mean, I think just big picture, the Steelers mantra the entire offseason, and we spoke about it as much as anybody, was bully ball. That was the phrase of the offseason. They're going to be the bully ball type of team, and they're the ones getting stuffed in the, lo- in the locker right now because they're not bullying anybody. I mean, it's just it's been a total opposite of what they were at the back half of last year on their 7-2 and two stretch and what they were building and claiming to to try to do this year and it's really just not worked out to their favor and then just kind of a note on Pickett. one thing i think teams have taken away are those vertical sideline shots kenny pickett loves to throw sideline one-on-one against cover Mm -hmm. one kind of like how ben was you know ben kenny aren't big throw middle of the field type guys they're kind of the sideline i got one-on-one coverage let my guy especially a george pickens make a play defenses have taken that away they're playing cover three they're playing the corners off they're putting eight guys in the box to stop the run and really kind of forcing Pickett to go to different areas of the field and he struggled just flat out struggled so I think some of what Pickett likes has been taken away by the 49ers and the Browns so far yeah and you don't you don't see Kenny using his legs at all you know like he'll the rollouts are minimal you know and he's not as to what you saw, like using his leg to get the the first down, you, know, you haven't, I, I haven't really seen that, and that surprised me, um, because I just knew like if he can't, see, if he don't see anything, he's gonna take off, um, but that's not there. I don't know if it's just you know the guys are just getting him to to him too fast, or if he doesn't want to run or what. I, I have no idea, but um, it takes me back to. Mitch, I think Mitch, Mitch definitely did that um, in the beginning of the, the season when he was in. He was like, all right, uh, I'm just go ahead and run a little bit. But <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. I don't have an answer. But I think those guys have enough on tape to realize, OK, it's really us. We really have to execute a lot better. Um, yeah. If I could just say one more quick thing about the run game, because, again, I think it starts yeah. there for all the issues for this team. I just went through, I talked about this on the podcast this morning for Steelers Depot of an article on Thursday about this. I know it's been a small sample size. They didn't run the ball much against San Francisco, but they have not pulled their guards once on a running play this year. Like when you think Steelers run games that have been successful, you think David Castro, Alan Fanica, Moon Mullins in the 70s, guys that can pull, and they have the guys to do it. Say Waldo and James Daniels are athletic, physical guards who can pull and get out in space. And so you want to be physical, want to play bully ball, Let's get some down blocks on the front side, pull a guard around, crack somebody. I mean, you know, let's be physical about that. And they've not done that once. And that that surprised me because they've tried a lot and it really has not worked. Uh, their zone scheme has been terrible. But let's try some power, some kind of old school Pittsburgh Steelers football. And you know what? You thought that would be the case bringing in Darnell Washington. You True. think you yep. thought, you know, okay, they're going to be so dominant with the run game. They got this extra lineman, this guy that can block, and, you know, we need to use his hands. We can use his hands in the red zone, but they ain't getting in the red zone, so that's not happening. Um, And you just don't see it. And you did – I saw you put up something about Jalen and Najee, and I haven't had this conversation on camera just because I don't really believe in having this conversation one over the other. I believe in depth. I believe in being versatile at a position. Um, and I think the two complement each other. Uh, how do you feel about Najee, the, the running back room mm-hmm. in Pittsburgh? Yeah, I, I don't think it's this big debate. Who's the better guy, Warren versus Harris or Harris versus Warren? I'm with you. I'm happy to have both guys. I think they both have kind of different skill sets. And I'm a huge Jalen Warren fan. I love watching this guy last year in camp. Yeah. I love his story. You know, Snow College to Utah State, Oklahoma State undrafted guy. Super scrappy, super you know, kind of the the Nick Herbig of the offense, just hair on fire, a bit undersized, but just a little firecracker. Um, and I think he's done well in the, in the past game. He had some big plays against Cleveland. But I think if you look at some of the numbers, I mean, Najee has had a couple of good runs for as bad as this run game has been, and it's been pretty bad. I mean, he's got three runs of 15-plus yards. He's got two of 20-plus. He had one run of 20-plus yards last year. Look at basically every advanced metric, whether it's run success rate, yards per carry, 
yards after contact. Najee Harris is outperforming Jalen Warren. And, and again, the sample sizes are small. We're talking a couple carries for Warren. We're talking 16 carries for Harris. We'll see how it goes. And the, the run game and the line, the backs have to be better, but I don't see yes. it as this, you know, just toss Najee Harris aside. Jalen Warren is tremendously outproducing him. I think Warren's role is a third down back and rotational guy is exactly what it should be. And hopefully mm-hmm. this line blocks better and Harris will have more success. And I think people forget that, like, there's rushing and then there's, you know, passing yards. Like, as you see, you may see Jalen get a bunch of yards, but it's from a pass play. It's not necessarily from a rushing play. Um, So I think people get caught up in just seeing him run and knowing he's a running back. There's something I learned about Jalen when his family members told me, and I don't know if you've ever paid attention to this, but now I started to pay attention to it. He doesn't take his helmet off during games. Oh, really? I I never knew that. He has his helmet on the whole game. Um, And I started paying attention to it and I noticed it now. But it's so funny. It's like most guys, they go on the sideline and they take it off. He keeps it on. So so he's always like kind of like locked in, which I thought was like really cool Um, because I was a big Jalen fan last year. I saw something in him that, you know, definitely brought a fire to – to the offense and I love it. I love having the depth. Like I don't, I don't want the not having those two in the in the running back room. I, I love it. There's no reason to put one over the other when they are both capable of being um dominant forces in this offense. So I'll leave. Yeah. That. I mean J- Jalen's a dude. Like I love, I mean, this guy first caught my attention in camp last year. The first day in pads, they do backs on backers as they do every first day in pads. Yeah. And usually got a rookie in there. They're gonna a little wide eyed, a little unsure. And Warren was not, I mean, he was fearless and he had a great, not only just fearless, but like he performed well in that drill and that kind of set the tone throughout camp. And so I absolutely love the dude. I want to see him play, you know, a, a considerable amount, but we just can't put our blinders on to some of the numbers and the production. I mean, if right. if Warren had that cutback run that Harris had against Cleveland, we'd all be talking about what an amazing run that was. And no one talked about it with Najee Harris creating literally no. something out of nothing on that play. And and again, I mean, I think Warren is more explosive, more of a downhill guy. There's certainly advantages he has over Najee Harris and Harris is never going to be a big play guy. And, you know, it's not maybe ever going to be this top echelon type of running back, but um, I'm not displeased by the individual performance of Harris so far, but I recognize the run game as a whole must be far better than where it is right now. Yeah, I I, I can't wait for them to click. Um, and when do you have them clicking? Do you have them clicking after the bye? <laughs> Hopefully sooner. What? I mean, get this thing on track. Yeah, we we don't do very well on the West Coast. Um, we have Vegas, then we go to Houston. Um, I think we're home in Baltimore and, and we have a bye and then we are off to LA after the bye out of the bye. <sighs> um, and hopefully, hopefully Mika can go to Vegas with us. Cause I don't know. He'd be missing the West coast trips last year. What the last, the last time we went to uh, LA, we played the chargers. I think he had COVID. He missed the, mm-hmm. he missed that trip. So hopefully we can get to Vegas with us. Um, where do you see them struggling with the Raiders? I hadn't done a deep dive on the Raiders yet. Um, Hopefully this will be a chance to get the run game going. I I mean, I will say, I think the 49ers and Browns have really good fronts, really good linebackers, really impressive D line play. And they are tough teams to run. I mean, the 49ers were the best run defense in football last year. I'm betting Cleveland's going to be one of the better run defenses in football. They really have talent in new DC and Jim Schwartz. The Raiders so far have struggled. I think they gave up a bunch of yards to Buffalo maybe some in garbage time because they were getting blown out uh, in the second half of that one, but they don't really play a base defense or at least in terms of like a four, three or a three, four, like they're always in nickel. They always have a four, two, five defense. It's kind of like Buffalo and they play their nickel cornerback kind of exclusively. So there should be opportunities to run the ball. If you go heavy and kind of assert your will, hopefully that happens. Frankly, it needs to. Um, but I mean, I, I saw the stat that Josh Jacobs has faced loaded boxes, I think on all but five of his carries this year. And so, you know, play eight man boxes, try to bracket Devontae Adams, make Garoppolo beat you. That's kind of been the recipe teams have done to attack the Raiders so far. So Pittsburgh should probably emulate that. Yeah. And Kenny, watch out for Max, Max Crosby. You don't know that guy. Ben's familiar with that guy. <laughs> ben can tell you all about Max. Um, <laughs> so yeah, like I haven't seen a whole lot of film on the Raiders, so I'll be looking looking to see um, what I can find out about them. But I'm I'm excited for these guys to get out of Acushare Stadium, get into um, a different environment, and and hopefully play better. 
I don't know if, if going away is going to make them play better, but offensively, they got to play better. Uh, they'll be on the road, but we know Steelers fans travel, so there should be a decent amount of Steelers fans in Las Vegas. I, I won't hold you too much longer, but I will ask you, if it's still early. Um, injury reports are still lingering. Do you have a prediction for uh, the Raiders game? I know it's it's still early. <laughs> it is. Yeah, I'm not going to have one until uh, the podcast that we'll do for Friday. I mean, I'm leaning okay. towards Pittsburgh and just, I, first of all, my predictions are terrible. So generally running the yeah. other direction. I mean, I, I, I'm over two on the season. I'm the worst with, I don't know how people can give like advice on that stuff. Fantasy football, gambling advice. Cause I, I feel like I, I'd be the, I'd have the worst guilt ever because I'm always wrong with some of the, the prediction type stuff. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, you probably want me to pick the Raiders in this one, honestly, but I, I don't have a, a prediction right now. I mean, on paper, hopefully Pittsburgh can get back on track, kind of a get right type of game. But as you said, you know, they've been favorites over, well, actually, I think they're underdogs right now, but they've had games against the Raiders. You thought they were going to win that they've lost before West coast, as you said, never been particularly kind to the Steelers. And so how do you deal with a road game for the first time in a season? Can, you know, will things truly get back on track? You know, we'll have to wait and see, but I'm not entirely sure which way I'm leaning right now in terms of a uh, prediction. Yeah, uh, just for the sake of how tough it is for this offense to score and how bad they need a break and how bad they need a break out of media. Oh, I do want to ask you um, the chance. I do want to bring it up. Sorry. Um, no, I heard them, fine. of course. Um, I had the luxury of sitting next to Matt Canada's family. Um, mm. and uh, my heart was like broken because I I didn't appreciate it last year when I heard the chance for Kenny when Mitch was out there. So I definitely didn't appreciate it hearing the chance for Matt when um you know when when our guys are out there we're at home and it's like it's embarrassing to me. Um, how did you feel when you you know got a wind of those chants? Yeah, I guess I don't have too much of, a, of an opinion to be honest. I'm never going to tell a fan base or anyone what they can and and can't say mm -hmm. and chant. I mean, everyone can can do their own, own thing. I don't do that stuff just because, as you as you're alluding to, it's a human, it's a person. He's not trying yeah. to do a bad job out there. I can, you know, you want to be fair and and have a bit of respect towards that. I remember when I was a kid, uh, there was a pitcher uh, for the Pirates. His name was Tony Armors Jr. He was a, a terrible pitcher and he had a terrible outing. Was at the game and I was booing. I felt so bad afterwards for booing. It's still, I still have that feeling today of, 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 yeah. of booing Tony Armish Jr. So that's not my style, but I mean, it, it's the NFL. It's a, it, it's a results based business. When you don't do well, you're going to hear about it. Hating the OC is a national pastime in Pittsburgh. That is kind of the thing around that's here. That's what I'm saying. They haven't liked an offensive coordinator no. since Bruce Arians. They ran Todd Haley out of town. Now mm -hmm. they want him back. I guess it's like you guys <laughs> don't like offensive coordinators. Right. I mean, so and, and, and there's been some underwhelming groups, but yeah, I, I, you know, but but they they got to get results. I mean, you don't get results in Pittsburgh. The standards high. You're going to hear about it. But I mean, it's whether it's Feetner, Haley, Canada. If they fire Canada, the next guy probably gets the same treatment. I mean, it just kind of. You know, you yeah, it's a job I would totally pass on. Like nobody wants that job. <laughs> I don't want that job. You be like, you can't. You, nope, nope, not calling plays. Um, but yeah, like just just like the story you just said. I look. I turned around and looked the guy in the eye as he's booing. You know, cheering on the Mac Canada, and he. I looked him dead in the eye, and he stopped. And he was just mm -hmm. like, "It wasn't me. It was the. It was them." I'm like, "I saw you." <laughs> you know, so people don't even openly, you know want to like own it they just you know just want to be a part of it mm -hmm. which is weird but anyway I mean, again, um, he should get criticism. I mean, he's not above reproach, obviously. Um, right. I, I just, you know, and I know you do too, you know, try to be as fair as possible. And and there are some things he shouldn't be blamed for. I mean, there are some things that, you know, aren't his fault and players have to execute. That's not been there either. But uh, as we mentioned earlier, I mean, this is the year for the results. No more excuses. You know, year one, year two, you can make all the excuses. And, and some of those were valid, but this is the year it's got to come together. And so far it hasn't. But, you know, it's a long season. If they play well against the Raiders, hopefully get some good things going and some good tape feel good about themselves and carry that forward. Yeah. I can't wait to see a clip from him in the booth, actually celebrating a 40 point game or something <laughs> from the office. Or, or, or 30. Let's get to 30. It's been a struggle yeah. just to get in, So we'll take look, that. When we had 26, even though 14 <laughs> came from the defense, I was like, look, I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy with 26. <laughs> 
So we'll yeah, and we just we got to give a quick shout out to Boss. Good bounce back season for him. I mean, he has so money from fifty plus, and in Pittsburgh, yes. he never could hit fifty plus. I know it's probably a bit easier these days than it used to be, but Boss has been such an asset. I we didn't talk about special teams at all, so I'm thinking you're bringing it up. Can you tell me how you're feeling about Presley Harvey? I think he had a bounce back game this week. Yeah, it was good for the team and probably good for him. He needs some confidence, too. It was a tough week one. He certainly heard a lot of criticism. I thought he was excellent. I thought field position was a going into that game. Harvin was my X factor. I mean, I thought field position was going to be really important. If Pittsburgh was going to win that game, it'd be you know tight game. You know, maybe not you know, terribly you know big shootout style wouldn't be those kinds of things. Can you back up the offense, help your defense out, maybe get good field position for your offense? So I thought Harvin was excellent. Um, obviously consistency has always been the, the the concern with him. I thought he had a really good camp overall, so he's got to keep it going, of course, but that was good for him and, and, and obviously good for the team. Yeah. And I saw like when he had the good punts, how everybody kind of congratulated him and came up to him and they encouraged him and like high five him and everything. So shout out to the team coming together and supporting each morning out of it. Um, but one, thank you, Alex, so much, everybody, Alex, tell everybody where they can find you first. Yeah, SteelersDepot.com, and you can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazor, and we'll uh, preview the game Friday, get some scouting reports out, and of course be covering it Sunday night. The night games, though, the, oh, the night games are so rough. Give me a 1 o'clock game all day, but uh, we'll, oh we'll have fun. Oh my gosh, play. yes, <laughs> they are. Uh, they are, they're torturous. That one was never ending, but thank you so so much, Alex. Make sure you take out Steelers Depot, check out Alex. They have Everything from injury reports to grades to podcasts, they have it all. So make sure you go over there and check those guys out. Thank you so much for joining me today, Axe. Thank you, D. Take care.